manipulation, leadership, the high demands, the manipulation, and the exploitation. This is a derivative of the definition of the cults that we want to talk about. And the next one, Ron. But the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has several uh, rights that are relevant to our field and our, and our concerns. Article 18 says, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, and to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. That is the theory that many governments have signed off on to. A related human right is everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media from the godless of frontiers. These two rights, as many of you know, sometimes come into conflict because people who very much value their religious beliefs are upset by other people exercising their freedom of expression. The uh, case with the uh, Dutch cartoon, uh, the Dutch filmmaker who was murdered is perhaps a, a blatant example of that. Next one. The sources of the controversy revolve around different perspectives on what is a religion. Uh, different countries in Europe, for example, have different legal uh, uh, approaches toward religion. In some countries, religions actually have to apply to be a religion. In other countries, it's easy, like in the United States, it's very easy to become a religion and to get the tax exemption. In other countries, it's difficult. Another source of controversy is who determines which groups in a country qualify as religions. <laughs> Does the offensiveness of A's exercise of freedom of expression constitute a violation of B's freedom of religion? In my conversation with one member of a controversial group recently, for example, she was very real that people should have freedom of expression, but not if it hurts people. Okay, and you know, what hurts people? You know, being offended is a threat. It could be psychologically wounded, but does that mean that you can't talk because what you say makes me upset? This is an area of controversy, and different societies approach it differently. The converse of that is, does A's exercise freedom of religion constitute a violation of B's freedom of thought, freedom to change religion? An example of that would be a Jehovah's Witnesses that knocks on your door and proselytizes. Some people feel that they've been violated. In, in our special issue on cults evangelicals and the ethics of social influence, one of the writers talked about the right not to be bothered. Okay, now, does the right not to be bothered outweigh someone else's right to free speech? Now, these are not necessarily easy issues to resolve. That's right. I think the core that issue that causes the uh, controversy revolves around power and the, the misuse of power. And in this field, the misuse of power generally is either by governments or by groups. And, uh, I thought I used to lead in this slide. Governments and the laws under which they are in, okay. When, when a government or the government's legal system misuses its power, the government is called upon to reconcile the conflicts that gave rise to the misuse of power. This is one of the uh, kind of inherent conflicts of interest in this field that governments have in particular, because we turn to government to resolve fundamental conflicts. We turn to the rule of law. But if your government is misusing the power, the government is, is both the player and the referee. And it, it can make us uh, great examples of injustice. In some of the more authoritarian systems, for example, religious groups have been suppressed and have been persecuted, even physically, people physically harmed. Uh, because, and there's no way to stop that because the government decides the uh, legal outcomes of people who might protest. In the United States and 
most modern Western democracies, there are various systems of checks and balances. For instance, in this country, we have an independent executive, legislative, and judicial branch, which in theory provides a check on government misbehavior. We all know that the theory isn't quite all that good, but generally speaking, we're a lot better off in terms of freedom, in a balance of freedom and order than was the case throughout most of human history. But in political systems that concentrate power in a few, the capacity for misbehavior may be greater. And that misbehavior could be the suppression of religious freedom. It could also be the imposition of a religious perspective. Okay, the next one. When you have power, you have, as Lord Acton famously said, the tendency to corruption. And this statement really says a lot. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is a risk of governments abusing power. The laws strive towards the ideals reflected in documents such as the uh, United Nations Declaration on Human Rights. Politicians are torn between the duty to uphold the law and pressure from constituent groups seeking changes in the law on the manner of enforcing it. And that means in a democracy you get different lobbies. You have a religious freedom lobby, you have a religion victims lobby, you have popular prejudices, uh, which are expressed through uh, popular opinion, and you have the politician's desire to retain power. So politicians are trying to navigate their way through these different pressures. The challenge is to find a balance between the competing uh, claims to, to a right. And the next slide. Okay. Uh, Lord Acton's rule, manifesting in contemporary history, finds the powerful, charismatic leaders accountable to nobody seem to easily, easily be corrupted by their influence over followers. Now I'll talk about the power that uh, comes to be inside groups, particularly cultic groups. You have a concentration of power. In a sense, these are like fiefdoms. And you, you have the, the lord of the manor who has absolute power over the, the uh, peasants, who, who are his serfs. So it's small and it may be overlooked. And it can exist as a, a, a kind of authoritarian uh, nodule inside a very pluralistic and open culture. Indeed, when uh, authoritarian governments have liberalized, we've seen a growth in cults. When the Soviet Union collapsed, for instance, in 1989, I think it was, uh, in, in our newspaper, the Cult Observer, we reported on all the major cults heading over to the Soviet Union. This was virgin territory. It was an open market. And it, cults became a problem in Russia. They, they, they weren't a problem before because you just arrested them and put them in jail. Uh, now, I think it's important to keep in mind that the abuse of power is not unique to cults. Psychotherapy, psychotherapists can abuse their clients, parents abuse their children, husbands can abuse their wives, sometimes you get wives who abuse their husbands. Um, abuse occurs in all areas of life where you have someone with a power differential over another person who loses his, his ethical boundaries and takes advantage of that person, sometimes hurts that person. In psychotherapy, for instance, the percentages of uh, clinicians who have had sex with their clients was high enough to cause quite a controversy, at least in the American Psychological Association in the 1980s, which changed its ethical code regarding sex between therapists and clients because of research studies that found several percent of psych psychologists having had sex with their clients. And they felt it was an, inherently ex an inherent exploitation because of the power differential. The cult leaders certainly have that power differential in spades. Okay, and uh, sometimes a sense of checks and balances can emerge from groups. 
this is the, uh, in this, with this point, I'm trying to refer to those situations where groups will t try to clean up their own acts, where they be, they become aware of controversy within their ranks, they become aware of groups uh, abuses, and they try to do something about it. The International Society of Krishna Con Consciousness is a case in point. We had sessions at a conference a number of years ago in which members of Krishna talked about the abuse of women in Hare Krishna and uh, child abuse in Hare Krishna. The child abuse that went on in the Garubalas, the religious schools of Krishna, was first published in their own journal, the Iskand Communications Journal. We republished that, reprinted that essay by Burke Rochford, a sociologist from Middlebury College, in our journal. Uh, and ISKCON today is still going through a conflict battle, power struggle in a sense, between reformers and old God, and it will vary from country to country and attempt it's a very complex picture. But we who are critics of cults should not lose sight of the fact that change can occur from inside. That's partly why we were pleased to have the session today that Mike Kropfeld moderated on uh, bringing about change in groups. And our obligation, I think, as critics, is to try to uh, phrase and structure our criticism in ways that will enhance the probability of groups changing in a cons constructive manner, rather than driving them into a corner and, and creating a deviance amp amplification. Okay. And obviously, sometimes governments unfairly oppress religion in the name of protecting victims. There's much dis uh, discussion in Europe, for instance, about the different approaches of different countries. Mike Kropfeld, by the way, has written on this, and, and in Info Cult's uh, website has perhaps the best collection of government reports in this area. Um, China has had a, lo a lot of controversy regarding their persecution, particularly of Falun Gong, but also of other, organi other religious organizations. So this, you know, power, the abuse of power by governments can hurt people who are practicing their religion, both people in mainstream religions and people in cult organizations. In an open, pluralistic society, we have to tolerate people and groups whom we don't like. You know, otherwise, we cease to be open and pluralistic. The challenge, again, is one of balance. One person is, once said that it's good to be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brains fall out. And, and finding that point where you, know, you have an open mind, but you're not really naive and silly is not easy. That is a very difficult thing. Next slide, Ron. The religious freedom lobbies are relatively strong in most democracies. That's because uh, mainstream religions and cultic groups will often become allies. For example, when Reverend Moon was being prosecuted for tax evasion, Moon of the Unification Church Moonies, uh, mainstream religions, including, I believe, the uh, American Jewish Committee, the Interreligious Affairs Director of which was Rabbi Rubin, who was one of the key critics of cults, signed on to an amicus brief, which is a friend of the court brief, uh, supporting whom. Marsh is here, she can correct me if I'm wrong. No, he did not. <laughs> not Jim didn't sign on, but didn't the UJC yeah, I sign on? I believe so. Yeah, I, I think they oh, did. I thought you were meaning Jim. No, not Jim. No, not Jim. Okay. But what I'm saying is, even even with his position, <laughs> even with his high position in the organization, I think the organization signed on. I might be wrong. If That's they did it, many main, many mainstream organizations did. You know, churches and so on, because they were afraid of the government. So they uh, ally themselves with the controversial cultic group, not because they like it, but because they're afraid of the government. Uh, so the religious freedom lobby is pretty strong, certainly in the United States and probably in most European countries. The religion victim lobbies are relatively weak in most democracies. In the United States, it's very, very weak. The, the 
there's virtually no political influence at all. There was a time in the late 70s when there was some influence and people succeeded in passing conservatorship laws that would have allowed, in, uh, made proposals of conservatorship laws in several states that would have allowed parents to forcibly take their kids out of the group for psychiatric observation. Then and now, I still think that was a dumb idea. But it wasn't passed. And politicians became aware of the fact that the so-called anti-cult movement was really a small movement in terms of numbers relative to the numbers of people who vote. And in the United States, the uh, lobby of religious vi religion victims is very weak. In some European countries, it's different. You know, France, for instance, uh, spends a lot of money in this area. The French organization actually gets gets us, you know, money that we would never dream of getting. Uh, and other countries in Europe fund organizations to investigate and, and monitor the culture groups and, and help victims. Some governments seem to favor religious freedom over the rights of religion victims. You know, this is some, a complaint we hear often in, in the United States. Uh, and some governments run roughshod over religious freedom. This is the uh, cases I referred to earlier, such as in, in China and perhaps to a lesser degree in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, Russia. Uh, you date yourself when you say the Soviet Union instead of Russia. I'm sure you can fill up saying Russia. Uh, and I, I think what we need to do is we need more compelling articulation and documentation of the claims of religion victims. This is one reason why ICSA puts a lot of emphasis on research. If you can document the harms more compellingly, then you can make a better case for changes or even adjustments in the law. And related to that, if you can educate legal, law enforcement, and political authorities, then they might be less diffident, excuse me, about enforcing laws against religion. God versus the Gavel, a book that uh, should, may still be on sale in the bookstore unless it's sold out, was written by a law professor, Marcy Hamilton, who spoke at our Philadelphia conference. And she is arguing not so much for new laws, she's just arguing for a, in a sense, a return to the relationship between church and state that historically existed. That we now have kind of a, a state uh, that perhaps fearing political correctness and pressure tends to be afraid to act in an area of religion. A, a dramatic example of that occurred with Aum Shinrikyo in Japan. Uh, we published an article by, I, I, my, I, I don't want to say the author because I might get it wrong, by one of our Japanese colleagues who said that in his opinion, had the police in Japan not been so afraid to act, the disaster of the release of sarin gas in the Tokyo subway by home may never have occurred. But contrary to the propaganda of the religious freedom lobby that uh, cults were persecuted, it was actually the opposite, that the authorities were so afraid to appear to be persecuting that they, they stepped back where they should have been acting. I think this also occurs in other institutions, and the Legion of Christ, which Paul Lennon talked about this morning, is probably a good example of the Catholic Church being slow to act against abuses of authority. Okay, the next one. I think we need to rebut more effectively the invalid claims by some religious freedom lobbies, such as what I alluded to earlier, that criticizing con criticism constitutes suppression. You know, if I think that your church is baloney, I'm not, I'm not narrow, I'm not abridging your religious freedom. I'm only religion your, abridging your religious freedom if I do something to prevent you from exercising your freedom of religion. But if I tell you I don't like your religion, that's my freedom of speech. And it's up to you to live with the fact that not everybody likes everything you like. So to me, free speech is, is a fundamental freedom. 
as, as religious freedom. I said, in my opinion, it's the most fundamental freedom because without it, a society can't correct itself. I do think, though, that we critics have an obligation to advocate for sensible proposals to help victims. Conservatorships, even criminalizing mind control, which is on the table in some European countries, I, are not uh, fruitful approaches, in my opinion. If you criminalize mind control, you're saying people who utilize highly manipulative techniques to control other people should be put in jail. Who utilizes highly manipulative techniques? It's the ex-members of this room who used to be cult members. Okay? And I think the hope of these laws is that you're going to get the cult member in jail. But the probability of getting the cult member in jail is so remote, much more remote than getting a mafia leader in jail, which is tough enough to do. Because if you're dealing with the mafia and you catch someone lower down on the hierarchy, he's going to rat on the people above him in order to save himself. If you, can, if you uh, prosecute a cult member, he will gladly sacrifice himself for the guru, or the reverend, or whatever it is. He's not going to rat on them. You're not going to get them to turn state's evidence. So the problem, in my opinion, the probability of getting a cult leader by criminalizing mind control is very low, and the probability of putting in jail those who have been victimized themselves becomes very high. Um, okay. Uh, Ron, could you go back to that other one? Because I think there was something else. Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, we ought to focus on what can actually have a, a, a good effect. Education, research, helping victims. I mean, this is what ICSA has been doing for many years. You help people who have been hurt. You try to educate people so they're less likely to, to go into cultic groups. You conduct research so that you can make a more compelling case. Uh, and I think critical to that is the systematic compilation of case reports. The, the multidisciplinary nature of this organization uh, emphasizes that point because in certain disciplines like my own of psychology, there's an emphasis on empirical research. And I do believe in the value of empirical research, but that's sometimes very difficult to do in a real life field such as this. But the systematic compilation of case reports or participant observation can be useful, but it has to be conducted by people who are looking at harm. One of the problems I think we've had in research is the sociologists tend not to look at harm, not because they don't care, it's just not within their frame of reference when they work with groups. Whereas psychologists are more likely to look at harm, but psychologists, at least in this country, are constrained by the methodological conventions that want experimental uh, methodologies where you have control groups and so on. And in, at least in this organization, we provide a, a means for people to talk about and publish research studies that may not adhere to that rigorous standard that typ academic psychology typically wants. Uh, one, one person once said that, uh, well, probably more than one person, it has been said that the more rigorous your methodology in psychology, the more trivial your question. And the more important your question, the less rigorous your methodology. Okay, now we can go to the next one. I think, too, we need a more sophisticated, more sophisticated analysis of undue influences relevant to cult situations and the implications for law. Alan Shefflin and Rod Dubrow-Marshall have uh, been talking about the notion of uh, center on influence, ethics, uh, and the law. In, by studying influence from the broader perspective of social psychology, we can place cultic studies research in a context that becomes meaningful and interesting to other disciplines. Uh, Alvaro Rodriguez, one of our speakers at the University of Barcelona, has been working on a measure to try to measure psychological abuse across a variety of populations, cult members, abused women, workplace abuse. These kinds of academic research can help give added credibility to the concerns that spur many of the people in this room. 
I think also we need to hold authoritarian governments accountable by at minimum exposing abuses against individuals exercising freedom of religion and speech. And it, 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 to give governments the benefit of the abuse, we should distinguish episodic abuse of police power from abuses deriving from government policy. All countries will have abuse of police, ab police abuse. That's partly an individual matter. You will have policemen, like psychotherapists, like clergy, like parents, who will abuse the power that they hold. That's different from a government policy that encourages abuse. Um, Okay, next slide. And I think human rights organizations should actually be allies of religion victim advocates, not opponents. Very often people have seen the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, as an enemy because it has defended cults on occasion. But we have the human rights of cult victims as well as the human rights of people who belong to cults. And if we are blind to the latter, we actually would be less effective in supporting the former. Uh, and I think that what I'm saying also in different words is what I have up here, that we should also advocate religious freedom as well as justice for, for religious victims because they are not incompatible. It's the balance that we have to find, not one or the other. Now, maybe a few minutes for questions. And Alan Shefflin has stepped into the room with my door over. <laughs> and I asked Alan to be available to answer some questions that might have a uh, legal dimension that is beyond my ken. Maybe a few questions. Well, yes, does, so does ICSA have a, I mean, I guess it's a number on top of which we can't do any lobbying. Is there any group that does lobbying on behalf of our issues or a starting group that does lobbying? The question is, is there any group that lobbies on behalf of the issues that concern cult victims? I don't know of any. Does anyone else know of any? That's why I said the religious victim lobby is very weak. Can you another question. Bob, uh, Bob Pond. Doesn't the law recognize undue influence or mitigating the circumstances if you're going to be prosecuting and trying to do something where there might be some heavy law reform or, or that? That's the kind of question why I asked Alan to join us. <laughs> Speak up, Alan. The law for centuries has recognized undue influence, but uh, there's almost no case law. I ran brainwashing, mind control, brainwashing through the legal databases for every case uh, the appellate level decided in the United States, and there are only a handful that deal with cult issues. Uh, most lawyers have never heard of undue influence and would not know how to try a case that involved it. Plus, it's very, there, it has no dimensions, it's just a phrase. So if judges don't like to, to deal with undue influence issues because they want people to just essentially do what you want unless you really harm someone. So it's very loose in the, in the, um, in the legal literature. It does exist, but most of the cases involve either some form of elder abuse in getting people to change their wills, uh, a caretaker winds up with the family fortune, or in uh, domestic disputes involving custody battles where one parent accuses the other of brainwashing. It exists, you can use it, but it, it's hardly ever used. Um, and then I think that's a mistake. You know, but uh, it is the what the law says. That it's there, but it's not practical. In the same vein that there's a vacuum of lobbying, didn't you just describe a situation where there should be a proactive initiative in those most compatible states? And Virginia is one, by the way, where there are precedents for undue influence, where the scope can be broadened in a judicial recognizable sense to say, look, not only are you causing what are convenient, conventionally recognizes damages in uh, grandma's will or whatever, but as we heard this morning uh, from Dr. Stewart, lasting damages to the physical functioning and structure of the brain of the victims. So uh, are, are you agreeing that the, there's room for this, this new exploration? Uh, I agree completely. The difficulty is, as Michael said, that there is a um, religion lobby for uh, religious freedom, 
but no lobby for victims. In the elder abuse case, there's no lobby for abusing elders. Uh, and as a result, the courts don't generally hear about these cases. Uh, therefore, we need to find ways to strengthen the laws. But unlike the elder abuse cases, we're going to run across formidable opposition by saying that we're abridging freedom of religion. Can you, that, that's can you have a quick six to the yeah. other sessions and uh, try to get started? Okay. And you all can try to talk to Alan Scheffler during the break <laughs> and ask him your questions directly. <laughs>